Today's speakers will present in person from five different Foley offices. And among our speakers are, uh, and broadcasting from our Foley's um, Washington, D.C. office is Chet Speed. Chet is the Vice President, Vice President Public Policy of the American Medical Group Association. In that role, he is responsible for developing public policy that supports AMGA members and represents AMGA interests before Congress and federal agencies. Mr. Speed has over two decades of progressive experience as an attorney and government affairs professional in the healthcare field. From Foley's Boston office is Kevin Stone, an ACO, whose title is ACO Developer for Dartmouth Hitchcock. Kevin is a senior consultant and principal at Helms and Company and works part-time at Dartmouth Hitchcock on special projects. As a consultant, Kevin has helped develop physician hospital joint ventures and supported various organization affiliations, mergers, and acquisitions. Broadcasting from Foley's Orlando office is Dr. Len Fromer. He is the executive medical director of the group practice forum. In that role, Mr. For, uh, Dr. Frome leads a team engaged in national products with group practices that deliver education, tools, and services to achieve success in their clinical integration efforts. From Foley's Los Angeles office will be Judy Vaccaro, Managing Senior Associate General Counsel of WellPoint. In that role, um, Judy oversees the delivery of legal services to WellPoint's um, provider engagement and contracting staff in 14 states. And finally, broadcasting from Foley's uh, DC office is Bonnie Shaw, the Director of Commercial Strategies for Abbott Laboratories. Um, she, Bonnie is the Director of Commercial Strategy Primary Care in Abbott's U.S. Pharmaceutical Product Division. And she has national responsibility for a team of account executives dedicated to supporting quality improvement efforts in large physician group practices IDNs, and other organized systems of care. Now, on, on to the program. Um, I am very pleased to kick off today's program with uh, Chet Speed out of our, who is presenting out of our Washington office. Um, and the first one is a joint presentation. If we could move to the next slide, please. The first presentation will include um, a discussion of the history of ACOs, how ACOs are dealt with in PAPACA, the issues that are in play currently in Washington, D.C., CMS's requests for comments and representative responses, and strategic thinking and lessons learned about ACOs, about, uh, that we have learned about ACOs to date, and also some consideration of why, um, why ACOs are needed. Uh, we have a lot of material, and we hope to get through it. If, if we don't, I, we ask you to uh, read the outline and follow up with any questions you have. We'd be happy to follow up after the presentation. Now we'll go to the next slide and turn it over to Chet. All right, thank you very much, Fred. Um, I appreciate the introduction. I appreciate all the folks on listening in um, on the webinar, as well as those folks who are in the Foley uh, law firm offices around the country. Um, my presentation will touch on four of the areas that uh, Fred mentioned. Um, I'll talk about how the ACOs sort of came into being. I'll talk about some of the issues that are in play with CMS as they draft the regulations. And we'll talk about some of the strategic issues that uh, your clients may need to, to um, discuss amongst themselves when determining whether they want to be an ACO or not. And finally, because there is some skepticism um, about the ACO model itself, uh, we'll discuss some of the reasons why uh, ACOs may be a fairly viable alternative or, um, for the next several years to come. So as you're all painfully aware, there's a lot of discussion about ACOs um, in the media, in the trade press, et cetera, and within the Hill. Um, I think a lot of the discussion about ACOs is a lack of knowledge about what it may be. Um, is an ACO going to be hospital-driven? Will it be payer-driven? Will it be uh, physician-driven? Is it back to the future with managed care? Um, I think many folks believe there's little guidance on what an ACO is or may be. Um, I heard this yesterday, a prominent speaker described ACOs as a unicorn, which is a mystical creature with magical powers, but no one's ever seen one. Um, I think that once CMS comes out with the proposed regulations, uh, ACOs will take 
a little more shape. But before that happens, there are other sources out there that um, provide a spotlight into what an ACO may be and what it has been in the past, actually. Uh, I can think you can say that ACOs began sort of semi-officially with the discussion at MedPAC in 2006 uh, with some of the problems facing the Medicare fee-for-service program and some of the delivery system changes that could be used to affect those problems. There are also several uh, scholarly journal articles uh, to ha talking about delivery system changes um, in a way of uh, changing volume-based fee-for-service mechanisms we have right now. Uh, but frankly, if you really want a cheat sheet on what an ACO uh, is or may be, uh, take a look at the CMS Physician Group Practice Demonstration. Um, that was actually CMS's first foray into fee-for-service uh, fee uh, Medicare. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, the, the next, thank you. Um, the PGP demonstration was made up of 10 organizations. Um, they were surrounded by the country. As you can tell, there were um, most of these, the 10 sites were fairly organized systems of care. Uh, there were two standalone physician group practices. There were five integrated delivery systems. And there were two academic medical centers and one uh, network organization in Connecticut, Middlesex. Uh, <clears throat> right, you know, luckily for AMGA, nine out of the 10 PGP sites were AMGA members, and we learned a lot from their experiences. Next slide. Uh, the demonstration spanned five years and encouraged coordination between Medicare's Part A and B, which meant that the physicians and hospitals had to work together. Uh, the demonstration pretty much tested the idea of whether medical groups uh, could dec decrease cost and improve quality at the same time. Uh, along those lines, the group practices had to meet 30 32 quality improvement metrics, and they had to achieve uh, a 2 percent savings threshold before they were allowed to share savings with Medicare. And the group practices, I'm sorry, the PGP demonstration sites were allowed to uh, share savings uh, between CMS after they met, after they met various quality and, quality, uh, quality and cost metrics. Um, the demonstration uh, performance was fairly strong. All the PGP demonstration sites met their quality uh, metrics requirements, and the PGP demonstration saved over the four years of known demonstration data around $125 million to Medicare. And six demonstration sites shared with $77 million of savings with CMS. Uh, next slide, please. As I mentioned, there was uh, 32 quality metrics that the PGP demonstration sites had to meet. Uh, as you can see, they all focused on high cost, high, um, high volume disease conditions, uh, which is really the best way of attacking um, the cost and quality problems currently in Medicare. Uh, one of the important I issues related to the quality metrics was uh, CMS uh, allowed the PGP demonstration folks to report uh, the quality metrics over a three year period. Um, they allowed the, uh, the PGP sites would uh, submit data on eight measures in year one, 16 measures in year two, and all 32 measures in year three. The reason why that was significant was because um, requiring the PGP folks to uh, submit data on all 32 measures in year one would have been uh, very difficult and challenging. Um, and I think, next slide, please. And there's your uh, statute that uh, establishes the ACO program within Medicare. I think the reason why the PGP demonstration is so important to the ACOs and why people can learn from it is because uh, Congress based its ACO statute largely, largely on the experiences of those five PGP sites. You know, as, as Fred will describe in very good detail in a little bit, um, the ACO statute mimics in a lot of ways uh, the PGP demonstration. Obviously, ACOs in the future will need to hit cost and quality um, metrics. They'll have to have an infrastructure that allows them to um, collect data and submit that data, both cost and quality to CMS. And finally, the statute requires that there be both administrative and clinical uh, leadership for ACOs, and this is something the PGP demonstration folks had in spades. Next slide, please. You know, and importantly, I think a lot of policymakers look at ACOs uh, as one of the signature delivery system reform pieces within the healthcare reform bill. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Senator Max Baucus, who's chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, um, really championed ACOs uh, during last year. And I think uh, it, it's beneficial to the ACO program uh, going forward that it has champions like Senator Baucus and, for that matter, the White House. Next slide, please. Oh, 
Uh, Fred, I think it's over to you. Thank you, Chet. Um, health reform has certainly been a catalyst for ACOs, but I think if you talk with most people, they say ACOs would probably develop irrespective of whether health reform had passed. Um, DPACA actually does very little to require or implement ACOs. And given the various issues that need to be worked through and the numerous steps that organizations that wishing to become ACOs will need, need it's probably not that surprising that uh, there's very little of, of required under DPACA about ACOs. Um, really, uh, ACOs are really only mentioned in two places in PAPACA. There's a voluntary Medicare shared savings program that's scheduled to start and, and be implemented by January 1st of 2012. Um, it's voluntary in the sense that if you participate, you can um, achieve some savings and uh, receive some carrots if you deliver some, uh, if you deliver quality and, and cost-effective care but it's no one is required to participate. There's also mention of a Medicaid pediatric accountable care demonstration program in PAPACA. Uh, I think it's fair to say, however, while it, accountable care organizations are only mentioned twice in PAPACA, that there are a lot of uh, other, other aspects of the health reform legislation that touch accountable care concepts. One of them is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, um, where they're testing concepts of uh, care delivery and care payment through demonstration and pilot programs. Next slide, please. Um, the next four slides will, will walk through the requirements in PAPACA for participation in the shared savings program. Um, I assume these are familiar to many of you, so we'll try and go through them pretty quickly. Um, entities seeking to be ACOs under, under the shared savings program, the Medicare shared savings program, must have shared governance, possess a willingness to become accountable for quality, cost, and overall care, enter a three-year uh, agreement with CMS to participate, have a formal legal structure that permits the receipt and distribution of payments. Next slide, please. Uh, have primary care professionals sufficient in number for Medicare beneficiaries assigned to the ACO, and it's a minimum of 5,000 Medicare beneficiaries. Provides the Secretary of HHS with information the Secretary specifies concerning uh, um, PCPs, to, uh, sufficient PCPs to support assignment of Medicare beneficiaries to the ACO. The implementation of quality and other reporting as required by the Secretary and the determination of shared savings. Next slide, please. ACOs must also have in place leadership and management structure, including clinical and administrative systems. Um, ACOs must define processes to promote evidence-based and patient evidence-based medicine and patient engagement, to report on quality and cost, and to coordinate care. Next slide, please. And ACOs must demonstrate that they meet patient-centeredness criteria as specified by the secretary through such use of patient and caregiver assessments or individualized care plans. I think all of these requirements um, are, are very general. Um, in many places, secretarial guidance to define what they mean by patient-centeredness will, will come, and I think, uh, frankly, that's what the regulations will specify and, and make a lot of these general terms more specific. Next slide, please. Um, the shared savings program, in the shared savings program, uh, PAPACA authorizes the secretary to utilize payment models other than the shared savings program. In particular, they mention that the secretary may utilize a partial capitation model where an ACO is put at financial risk for some, but not all of the Part A and Part B services provided. And the secretary is authorized to substitute any payment model that the secretary determines will improve quality and efficiency. Both of these provisions were late adds to the health reform legislation, and um, it would be interesting to see what uh, CMS does with respect to them. Next slide, please. Uh, DPACA authori also authorizes the secretary to waive certain federal laws to make ACOs workable. 
In particular, the Stark Law, the anti-kickback statute, and the CMP law are ones that people have, as well as antitrust laws, are ones that this, um, we expect some movement of federal um, waiver authority exercised. Uh, I should point out that while they can waive federal law, they cannot waive state law. So that would continue, and many states have a corollary to these statutes. As mentioned earlier, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Intervention is created in PAPACA um, to test payment and other arrangements. It's funded with $10 billion over nine years, um, and there's some real opportunities there for people to experiment with um, accountable care concepts. There also are a number of demonstration and pilot programs really testing and um, accountable care concepts and allowing organizations to, to assess their readiness for ACOs before their full implementation. Uh, there's a Medicaid pediatric ACO demonstration pro project that I mentioned previously, but we also have a number of other ones that are listed on this and, and the next slide. Next slide, please that uh, we're going to see um, some activities under, and organizations are can participate in these programs if they apply and meet the criteria. I, I'm going to turn it back to um, for Chet, who's resident in D.C., and can talk ab about the issues that are play in play currently in D.C. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. And thank you, Fred. Um, so what are the issues in play right now regarding uh, ACOs? Um, the first one, of course, is the uh, proposed rules coming from CMS. Um, they've been pushed back. Uh, the deadline for regs has been pushed back uh, several times. Um, I think there's a few reasons for that. Uh, the first one, and to put things in perspective, is um, you know, the Stark statute regulations took uh, well over a decade to be finalized, and I think they're still not finished. Uh, isn't that right, Fred? Um, it certainly is. Okay. So, you know, that statute took well over a decade for final regs, and uh, you know, when you think about it, CMS has around uh, 12 months to come up with a regulatory framework for a brand new care entity. Uh, so they've had a lot of um, work uh, crammed onto them regarding ACOs, and that's on top of all the other work that um, they had <clears throat> uh, given to them by Congress for the health care reform bill. Um, so they have a substantial workload issue over at CMS. Um, and there's some other issues related uh, that CMS has to handle. There is some uh, very complicated, if not yet contentious, issues that CMS needs to resolve before it issues its proposed rule. Uh, Fred will get to a lot of these in more detail later, uh, but some of the issues in play um, for the reg writers right now is your patient, at patient attribution. You know, who is in uh, the ACO and whether they can opt in, opt out, voluntary, involuntary, uh, which quality measures. Uh, will be included in the ACO program. As I mentioned, the PGP demonstration had 32 quality measures, and the uh, PGP folks were allowed to submit data on them over three years. Um, our hope, of course, is that the focus on the measures is high-cost, high-volume disease conditions. The other uh, big issue was savings percentage. Under the uh, PGP demonstration, there was an 80-20 split, uh, PGP size to CMS. Um, what will that be in the regs, 80-20, is it 50-50? We don't know yet. And what will the savings threshold be? Uh, the savings threshold in the demonstration was 2%, and now it's a significant obstacle uh, for PGP success. Uh, there's a lot of concern that CMS may set the threshold at a fairly high level, uh, which may impede folks from uh, deciding to become ACOs. Another big, another large issue is partial capitation. Uh, the question being, how will CMS deal with the partial capitation uh, provision within the statute? Next slide, please. Other issues in play, of course, are shared governance, uh, who's committed to accountable care, uh, risk adjustment, uh, use of evidence-based medicine, what, in, what indeed is patient-centered care. You hear that a lot, but a lot of folks don't know what that means. Uh, how do you keep patients in the ACO network and the waivers of law, which uh, FTC, OIG, uh, will issue supposedly at the same time as CMS issues its CMS proposed rule. That should be very interesting. Uh, next slide, please. And some other issues in play, not necessarily in the CMS realm, um, you know, startup and maintenance costs. Uh, the startup and maintenance costs to put in the infrastructure uh, that's necessary to manage a population of patients is enormous. Uh, PGP demonstration folks uh, basically invested 
startup and each and maintenance costs about seven figures each year. So before ACOs, uh, before providers determine if they want to be an ACO or not, they need to consider the seven-figure startup and maintenance cost it is to be an ACO. Uh, another issue is performance feedback. Uh, the PGP folks received uh, feedback um, on their cost and quality and who was in the patient population um, after the performance year was over. Uh, feedback, of course, from CMS had to be much quicker uh, for the ACO program to be successful. Another issue is resources, and it's not necessarily um, provider resources, but rather CMS resources. Does CMS, does CMS have the staff and financial resources uh, to take on a very robust um, number of ACOs on day one? Um, I think there's some significant issues related to whether they do have those resources, in fact. Next slide, please. And we take it back to Fred. Um, CMS has twice solicited comments about the implementation of ACOs, first on legal barriers and the second on more specific operational issues. The next slide, please. Um, September 17, 2010, CMS solicited, first solicited comments, and they were asking and really focused on how to apply various laws to new reimbursement models for ACOs, and in particular, um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the laws that seem to be most front and center are the antitrust laws, the anti-kickback statute, the Stark law, and the CMP law. The, the CMP law is the one that precludes hospital payments to limit or restrict um, medical care. Um, they also are seeking author um, clarification and comments on the exercise of their waiver authority with respect to such laws. Next slide, please. With respect to the legal barriers, uh, the focus is really on the payment relationships under, under the existing laws. Um, the antitrust law issue really involves joint negotiation by independent providers uh, of fees. Um, the, com the provider community generally responded that there is need for flexibility when clinical and financial integration are present. Um, that uh, there has been a, a lot of enforcement in the antitrust areas of, over the joint negotiation with payors, and it's, um, I, I think there have been over 20 cases in the last 10 years uh, of successful enforcement. And the provider community says we need flexibility, we need an understanding. Um, the financial and clinical integration pieces that um, uh, would legalize and make appropriate consistently with the antitrust laws for this joint uh, collaborate, collaboration creates some real barriers and, and, and there is a need for flexibility uh, according to the provider community. Next slide, please. The insurance industry has generally had a different response and, and they fear that ACOs may lead to market power concentrations that will limit competition and drive up prices and not benefit consumers. They've commented that they encourage the, the CMS should encourage multiple ACOs in each market to enhance competition and to be very careful in relaxing antitrust laws. Um, next slide, please. Um, with respect to the other fraud and abuse type laws, um, an initial question that CMS uh, asked was, providers are forming ACOs now. Do we really need to change the various uh, fraud and abuse laws? People are seem to be actively pursuing them without changes. Um, the provider response is, again, we need more flexibility to avoid the risk. There is inherent risk every time you um, work on an ACO kind of project with different payment arrangements and the, relation, and the financial relationships with providers. And that risk lays on the, on the providers and the good discretion of prosecutors not to try and enforce. So there needs to be flexibility in sharing payments among ACO participants. Uh, there ought to be an ability to require referrals to be kept within the ACO participating network. Um, and there needs to be allow flexibility for health systems, hospitals, and large clinics to help uh, participants develop the infrastructure, the EMR and the other systems that, that Chet alluded to that can, cost, can be very expensive. And that the existing gui legal guidance provides only a very narrow a uh, way to make these things work without undue risk. 
other perspectives are, uh, that have been expressed is if you meet either the start or the anti-kickback safe harbor, you should be deemed to satisfy the other law. There should be flexibility in how uh, savings may be shared. There should be an ability to allow equity ownership of ACOs. Equity ownership today would create some challenges under the Stark Law and also qualifying for the um, uh, for the anti-kickback safe harbor. And there needs to be, a, a, while there probably will be a limit on uh, stinting of care, it should only regulate payments to limit medically unnecessary care. With respect to the CMP law, uh, PIPACA did include an amendment, a uh, very general language, that indicated it shouldn't be a violation of the CMP law if, if a payment arrangement promotes access to care and, and poses little risk of harm to patients and the federal government. Um, those are terms are, as I mentioned, very general and without much definition, but they give you something to talk about. There's also been a suggestion that we should only limit uh, payments to reduce medically unnecessary services. Uh, medically unnecessary is not language currently included in the CMP law. There's also been a suggestion that the employment arrangements, employment arrangements, which are exceptions to the Stark and the anti-kickback statutes, should also have an exception to the CMP law. Other commentators have focused on the state corporate practice of medicine, um, which can be a hindrance to ACO development in those states that have a, a robust um, corporate practice law. Um, and they, they uh, suggest that we allow physician employment in ACOs that have clinical integration. And state insurance regulations that will allow certain risk sharing by ACOs that would be deemed the business of insurance currently. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. And next one. Um, in November, on November 17th, uh, CMS also published a request for comments, um, and in that request sought answers, uh, sought answers and, and views on seven specific questions. The first one is how do we ensure that solo practitioners and small clinics may participate in ACOs? The second one was how to, how to assist small practices in accessing capital and other resources for shared savings and other payment models to be tested. The next one was how to attribute beneficiaries to ACOs and should be beneficiaries be attributed prior to the start of the performance period or at the end of the performance period. Next slide, please. Uh, how do we assess beneficiary and caregiver experiences was a question that they asked. What aspects of patient-centeredness should be included? What quality standards should be set as thresholds to receive shared savings? And they also in inquired as to what additional payment models should CMS consider and why. Next slide, please. Uh, there was a December 3rd deadline for submission of responses. Uh, over 750 responses were received. And in reviewing those, there was much consistency in the responses, although not unanimity by a, by a long slot. By a long slot. Um, and I've here tried to summarize some of the um, representative responses that, that were in those, uh, in those responses. With respect to ensuring participation of small groups, um, one of the Initial responses was, well, we need to eliminate regulatory bar uh, barriers which will impair clinical integration. And those will be particularly uh, problematic for, for small groups. We also need to limit the infrastructure and other requirements for ACOs to those that are really essential. The, the thought is that small groups will have a particular dif particularly difficult time um, paying for and implementing large infrastructure requirements. They also need payment policies that ensure small providers get the share of savings. And one comment was that they should support integration of small providers into larger integrated groups who are much better in a much better position to um, be ACOs out of the chute. Next slide, please. The point was also made that um, small groups would, would benefit if they allow providers to participate in more than one ACO and even there was a suggestion that there be an any willing provider to equal, 
uh, be able to equitably participate in an ACO, that anybody could come and knock on the door and say, I want in. Um, there also was a comment that the number of required participants should be kept low, that the 5,000 will be difficult for uh, smaller rural providers, perhaps. And on the, on the other hand, uh, some said to make ACOs effective, you need large populations of patients, and 5,000 is um, not enough. There also was a thought that we need to keep the threshold for shared savings low. 2% is too high, but the focus should be on small improvements in care. Next slide, please. Um, with respect to the access to capital resources for small groups, as Chet suggested, the um, ACOM came back and said that the minimum will be a million dollars of startup capital for small groups. Um, and, they, and that the small groups will need assistance for infrastructure, legal support, analytic tools, and workforce development. Um, another comment was that we need to create payment systems that pay ACOs up front for these key services. And we give a preferential share of savings up front to recoup these startup costs. Also a suggestion that loans, loan guarantees, and technical assistance programs developed that would be of assistance to small groups. Next slide, please. Also, not surprisingly and consistent with the prior comment, the CMS should share in these startup costs, and there should be payment to successful integrators to help the small groups participate through the larger groups. Um, there's payment systems that provide certainty on, on a payback would also be assistance, that if you participate, you're likely to get something. It's not, it's not a, a crapshoot. And if funding is may, may be made available, perhaps it should be limited to small um, and to small groups. If we might go to the next slide, please. With respect to patient attribution, um, the PGP program that Chet described um, empirically assigned um, to a provider based on the patient's historical care practices. So there's some thought that there may be um, assignment, sort of involuntary assignment. I think the, the comments that came back were that this should really be a voluntary assignment, sort of patient choice, and there also should be prospective assignment so that the ACO knows up front and throughout the period of time who's in, who is an ACO, part, um, who are the beneficiaries that are assigned and, and who aren't. Um, I think that the, a variety of the comments that we received, uh, that were received um, on the next two pages, if we might go to the next slide, um, reflect reflect this um, these comments. Um, one suggestion was that let the ACO bring the list of beneficiaries to CMS, and another comment was that we should assign a, a primary care physician to each beneficiary. Uh, next slide, please. The question of how to assess beneficiary and caregiver, caregiver experience, um, there were a number of comments that suggested the consumer assessment of healthcare provider system be utilized. Um, also a comment that let's use existing validated measurements so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. A lot of providers are accustomed to utilizing some of these systems and uh, the, the, the desire is that we could con just continue that without adding undue expense. It was also pointed out that the CAHPS program, which really relies on uh, patient and family standardized surveys following a, an episode in a hospital or, or, or of care, is too episode of care focused, and you need more than that. Um, another comment was we should ass assess by asking beneficiaries and caregivers what their experience has been. Next comment, please. And that there needs to be a shift from a disease perspective to a wellness perspective in, in assessing. How does, how does the ACO go about keeping you well? Um, all other comments were um, experience has shown that patient depression is very prevalent in, in, um, in patients being treated for hospi in hospitalization and that can affect the perception and that must be considered. And also if people have good family support or no family support in their hospitalization, that can also affect their experience, and those need to be kept in line. Uh, next comment, please. Um, Patient-centeredness, it was also something that was discussed. Um, CMS requested comments on it, 
and it really doesn't have a definition. Um, and the comment was, we need to define it. Uh, one of the a number of comments came back is, we need to define what patient-centeredness means. The focus should be on patient experience of care, patient self-management, shared decision-making. We need to include patient values in care delivery and need a model for team delivery of care. Next slide, please. Um, again, it was thought that this means look to the patient experience, not CMS developed standards, and the patient comes first, um, emphasizing patient wishes and needs in care delivery. Next slide, please. Um, keeping another other other comments were the focus on wellness and patients need to know what is what the expected outcome is and expected follow-up treatment up front and be informed throughout the day. Next slide, please. With respect to quality measures, um, again the comment was made that CMS should use existing me measures wherever wherever possible, discard existing measures that are not relevant, and adopt new CA. ACO specific measures only after thorough testing. It was pointed out that 75% of Medicare cost is chronic disease, so it's important to focus on chronic disease treatment. They also thought that the quality standards should be phased in over three years. Next slide, please. A comment also was made that ACO should have flexibility to tailor measures to specific population needs and that we work with the QIOs and the, and the regional healthcare improvement collaborations in local markets with respect to this. Again, the comment was made we need to phase in the quality measures and that, that the initial focus should be main, maintaining quality rather than expectation of large increases. Uh, next slide, please. The quality was again brought up and it was in, indicated that we need to remember the purpose when we assess quality, that, that they're to monitor the success of the ACO models and to provide meaningful information for consumers to make choices. And patient satisfaction was the best measurement. Next slide, please. A number of people, uh, larger groups particularly said, we're down the road on, a, on ACOs and we've done a lot with quality. So you can't penalize us by having a standard that says how, how much improvement have you made over where you were at the start of the program. Uh, the suggestion there was to use national standards so that they weren't penalized for already having taken steps to improve quality. In the outpatient set, uh, setting, the emphasis should be on um, chronic disease, a comment that was made earlier, and need to quickly report results, which Chet mentioned as a, a comment that came out of the PGP program. Um, the last question they asked, and next slide, please, um, about payment methods and why. Um, the comment was made that the change from fee-for-service will be hard. It's a, it's a mindset change in how you deliver care. Um, no payment method will work in all places, and you need to test mo new models in a thoughtful, staged approach, introducing risk over time. Next slide, please. Uh, what payment models should they adopt? It, it's, it's hard to straddle multiple models. The thought was that we sh there should be a model across all payers and, and, and uh, utilized by Medicare, but that the CMS should also consider partial capitation, risk corridors, per member per month care coordination fees that you see predominantly in uh, medical homes, uh, medical home combined with transitional care models and condition-specific capitation and bundled payments. Next slide, please. Um, comment was also made that the payments need to, ha need to cover GME, disproportionate share, wage variations. Again, the comment was made that we should use national ben benchmarks, not just providers past practice, because a number of, of providers have, are down the road a bit on, on delivering cost-effective care, and they'd be disadvantaged if there were uh, if they only look to their past behavior. And in capitation, the comment was made, be sure organization is able to take risk and that the payment method shouldn't encourage overtreatment or limitation of necessary care. Finally, um, it was suggested that population-based payments would be the best to use and full risk capitation would be very difficult and capitation really should only relate to what a particular provider performs. Comment was also made that stop loss coverage ought to be required and that we really need to assess whether providers are ready to take risk. 
and that the shared savings should allow recoupment of the required upfront investments. Um, those are a summary of a, a lot of the comments that were received, and now I'm going to turn it back to Chet for um, strategic thinking. <clears throat> Next slide. Thank you, Fred, and I'll, I'm uh, cognizant of the time, so I'll try to go through this fairly quickly. Um, uh, along with the uh, legal issues that Fred discussed, um, and you'll have discussions with your clients, particularly in regards to STAR, kickback, and CMP, et cetera, there's, um, lawyers may want to provide counsel to their clients regarding some of the strategic level um, issues that are important before deciding to become an ACO. Um, we had a lot of discussions with our medical group leaders on what discussions they're having uh, before they decide to be an ACO. And uh, four main themes came from those discussions. Uh, the four discussions that they have um, are executive level thinking, um, technology um, requirements, uh, care management process requirements, and appropriate culture for becoming an ACO. So the first thing um, an, a potential ACO may want to do is uh, get the executive um, level team together in a room and ask a series of baseline questions. You know, first off, do we want to be an ACO in the first place? Uh, there are significant financial and cultural issues regarded, related to being an ACO. Uh, do we fit the statutory definition of an ACO? Do we have the primary care capacity to be an ACO? Do we have the 5,000 primary care beneficiaries uh, that are required by the statute? And in all honesty, uh, to be a successful ACO, you probably need um, uh, far more beneficiaries than 5,000. Um, also, will we be able to meet the quality metrics? When you think about uh, the PGP demonstration, uh, those quality metrics spanned um, physician services. They had diabetes. They had congestive heart failure. There was um, preventive measures, et cetera. So quality measures are going to span um, the continuum of physician services, and that means that an ACO is going to have to employ, contract, or be associated with a whole level of physician specialties and primary care physicians. And also, can the ACO meet the cost metrics? Uh, when you think about there are uh, the cost requirements are fairly significant to be an ACO, and a lot of that is going to come from the Part A side uh, with reduced admissions and ED visit reductions. So is the ACO prepared uh, to make those type of changes um, to be an ACO? Next slide, please. Uh, some of the technology assessments that need to be considered before being an ACO. Um, do we have the technology to coordinate care? Uh, most group practice leaders we spoke with said it was, it was an absolute requirement to have an EMR uh, system within the ACO that also has a registry capacity that allows you to um, identify and track chronically ill beneficiaries. Uh, the EMR system has to be able to collect data and submit that quality and cost data to CMS in order to share in savings later on. And there has to be a, a fairly robust performance measurement capacity for the capability for the EMR system. It has to be able to measure physician um, performance and provide that performance uh, in feedback fashion back to the physician. Uh, doctors are very competitive, and receiving uh, performance feedback is one of the best ways to get them to improve their care. And finally, and this is very important, um, ACOs need to have the EMR and their um, IT department have the capability uh, to analyze the data they're reviewing and incorporate that data into clinical process redesign that allows them to um, change treatment regimes uh, to adapt to whatever um, gaps in uh, treatment are discovered through the data collection analysis. Next slide, please. Culture. Um, it was interesting to us, one of the key issues related to being an ACO um, dealt with culture. Um, our members spent a lot of time on that matter. Um, some of the questions that an a, a potential ACO needs to ask themselves is, uh, do they have a committed leadership uh, that's committed to reducing costs and improving quality? As mentioned, um, uh, this is a – becoming an ACO, a successful ACO, is a difficult slog, and you need to have a committed leadership um, that's there to create and maintain momentum to being an ACO over time. Also, physicians and hospitals have to work together. Uh, in many markets, uh, as you all are well aware, physicians and hospitals – don't always work too well together. To be successful, uh, physicians, uh, physicians of the medical staff of a hospital and the hospital administration are going to work together and do things they don't typically do, like sharing in governance, sharing in finance, sharing in information, sharing in goals and incentives. Um, that's a, a significant cultural issue that has to be overcome. On another level, 
uh, primary care physicians and the, specialty, and the specialty physicians need to cooperate. Primary care physicians have to have referral relationships with physicians like cardiologists and endocrinologists that treat um, disease conditions like hypertension and diabetes. And at the same time, specialists need to respect and understand the primary role that PC physicians have in care coordination in an ACO. And also another cultural issue is all physicians and mid-levels need to work as a team, um, particularly with the RNs and PAs. When we think about um, uh, licensing issues, uh, PAs and, and RNs are the, are the professionals that are best able to care coordinate, um, coordinate care for a chronically ill patient population. And also, physicians primarily need to be ready to be measured. Um, to be successful, as I mentioned earlier, uh, physician performance needs to be measured and feedback needs to be presented to those physicians in order to improve their care. A lot of physicians are new to this type of thing um, and leadership needs to get their physicians ready to be measured. And it also requires the physicians to buy into the measures that are be, being used to gauge their performance. Next slide, please. Care management. Uh, quite simply, does the potential ACO have the appropriate care managers in place, care management processes in place, uh, to successfully uh, coordinate care and meet your quality and cost metrics? Um, our group practice leaders stress the need to have team-based care, have a, a very um, large and dedicated stable of allied health professionals that are able to monitor a chronically ill patient population, provide the timely interventions uh, when, when they're necessary, and also, uh, does the ACO have a care transition capacity? In other words, uh, there's a lot of issues related to the quote-unquote handoffs between hospital discharge and the patient going home. Does the ACO have a process in place uh, that allows for a smooth transition um, from uh, acute to post-acute, whether it be a SNF or a nursing home in general or the home? Next slide, please. Fred, do I have time to continue, or should we wrap this up? Perhaps just a minute, Chet. Okay. So there's a lot of folks that are skeptical about, about ACOs for a host of, of reasons. It calls for uh, a fairly um, increased uh, use of pro provider integration and care coordination and care management techniques, uh, which aren't necessarily uh, too prevalent in our, in our current healthcare system. Um, ACOs have been described as innovative. And I guess that's true to a certain extent, um, but like a lot of innovations, I think people may try to sit this one out. And so the question is, you know, why should people consider um, becoming an ACO? And there's uh, a couple issues, a couple reasons that we discovered. You know, first off, from a healthcare system standpoint, um, our per capita spending and our percentage of costs of a GDP in health is more than double uh, than a lot of um, other Western European nations. Next slide, please. Uh, despite these costs, however, uh, we're not doing too well on the quality side of things. Um, and I understand that these two graphs do not um, – there's some omissions in these two graphs. For instance, the United States patient population is much larger than Canada or Germany or the Netherlands. Um, we have issues with patient compliance. Our exercise and diet are terrible. But at the same time, if you think about it this way, if you're the CEO – and this is a performance evaluation of one of your employees, um, you're either seriously, seriously worried or you're thinking about a pink slip. So from a macro level, um, our financing and delivery of health care in this country is not doing very well. Next slide, please. Uh, other ways of looking about this, we have an unsustainable uh, deficit and debt issue in this country, which will only be exacerbated by the fact that baby boomers are going to enter the Medicare population at a rate of 3.6 million each year. Um, on the delivery system side of things, our patients in, this, in the country only receive 55% of recommended care, the famous um, report that came out of several years ago. And if physicians were required to do all the things that are necessary to essentially care coordinate, uh, to coordinate care for all patients, they'll be working 21 hours a day. And to top that off, there's a, a primary care physician shortage. So from a delivery system standpoint and a financing standpoint, there's some significant issues uh, we're facing. Next, please. And um, along the same lines, I think it's safe to say that in the next several years, there will be some steep reimbursement cuts coming, uh, both in Medicare and private and the private uh, health care system. Um, Congress is going to have some significant policy cover to provide for deep cuts from IPAC and the Deficit Commission. And also, it's important to note, to note I think at least, um, 
I believe Mike, uh, Mike, Admiral Mike Mullen, who is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, said that health care is a national security issue uh, because of the um, increase that provides both the deficit and the debt. Next slide. And it's not just government uh, that's demanding changes. It's also our employers and our payers. Uh, they're demanding accountability and transparency. Uh, they're, de they're demanding better and improved patient outcomes with lower institutional costs. And um, essentially, they want reduced productivity, productivity losses uh, to their uh, employers, uh, to their employees. And I believe in a certain way, they're also demanding more care coordination across settings and physicians because they understand that that's the better way of providing care. And those are some of the whys um, for your clients to think about ACOs in the future. And that's it. Thank you, Chet. Um, before we move on to Kevin Stone, it, it, I want to mention it has come to our attention that some of you are having difficulty printing the material. Um, this seems to be a problem with the live meeting printing function. Um, we are working on it, and we'll make sure that you get the materials if, if you need them. Um, and please l let us know at the end of the day if you haven't been able to get them. Now we're going to move to Boston. Uh, Kevin Stone, ACO developer, Dartmouth-Hitchcock, and the presentation, ACOs, the Hospital Health System Perspective. Kevin? Thanks, Fred. Uh, uh, first of all, I'm just going to uh, apologize in advance. I'm recovering from bronchitis and mild pneumonia, so I may have to cough a few times. I'll try to suppress it. Uh, uh, the, the 22 inches of snow that we got being out shoveling really helped my health condition. Um, what I'd like to do today is uh, talk about the DH, Dharma Hitchcock experience with the, the PGP demonstration program that Chet referenced. Uh, and talk about what Dharma Hitchcock uh, did or attempted to do to, to try to be successful, how our five-year experience with that project then influenced uh, our commercial pair contracting uh, going forward. And if we have time, which looks like we probably won't, I could talk about the PGP experience for um, all of the 10 participants. Next slide, please. So the DH system, we are a fairly large um, we're pretty integrated, which, as you heard from, from Chen Fred, helped us, I think, with the PGP program. Uh, but we only have one hospital, uh, which is our tertiary center. We have four large group practices that are out in the community with some satellites. And that was the, sort of the, the, the locus of the membership in the PGP uh, demonstration program. We have some community hospital partnerships that we work with, but uh, again, under the PGP demonstration program, it was just for the physician group practice. We did not have the ability to share savings with those hospital partners. Um, we do have electronic medical records. That's not a typo. That S is there for a reason. We have been on electronic medical records for a while, but uh, different ones. And this spring, we're actually moving to one common system-wide uh, EMR, which we think will help us going forward. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the, uh, I'm, the prior slide mentioned that we have 23 NCQA level three designated medical homes. We had no medical homes when we started the PGP program. Uh, and in fact, it was because of our experience with the PGP uh, demonstration program that we ended up developing those uh, uh, qualified medical homes. Uh, and that's also what kind of got us started thinking about uh, this ACO thing. Um, our mission, uh, as set by our trustees, had always been to uh, try to provide good population health. So uh, the demonstration program was pretty congruent with how we were trying to run our delivery system anyway. Next slide, please. As Chet mentioned, the basic overview, we were one of ten groups. The assignment was done involuntarily. Members did not know they were assigned. Uh, it was done through attribution retrospectively. And basically, it was the, uh, looking at the preponderance of evaluation and management codes. And that was evaluation and management codes across all clinicians, not just primary care. So we ended up with some members attributed to us that got some primary care elsewhere, but because they had a lot of chronic illnesses and they were coming to us for specialty care and were getting some e and codes done when they saw the specialist, they ended up coming into our uh, uh, attributed pool. Uh, payment was just a regular old piece of service. Claims got uh, submitted and paid the same old way. And basically the, the goal was to beat 
the rise in, uh, in trend. So beat the trend, bend the curve uh, on a risk-adjusted basis. And if you did that, if you created savings, you got uh, uh, additional monies uh, depending on how you performed on quality. You didn't save money. Uh, you didn't get any payment even if you had tremendous quality. Uh, and as Chet mentioned, the first dollar savings is claimed by, by uh, Medicare. I will say it's not easy to beat a trend or to beat a cost target by more than 2%. And so when the first 2% goes out the door, it's tough to make uh, more savings, but we were able to do that in some instances. Next slide, please. So the economics, the way they work is you establish a baseline cost for your population and you establish a baseline risk score Medicare, Medicare used the DXCG risk adjuster. Uh, and then you were compared to your annual cost to that baseline. Um, outlier protection over $100,000. Uh, and we were also compared to a peer group. In our case, the peer group was within the same geographic service area uh, that our own clinicians worked in. Uh, if we beat the, the, the trend on the peer group, we would then get a bonus, and there was the 32 quality metrics that were then um, used to determine how much of that pool we received. Next slide, please. So how do we do? We had 32,000 lives attributed to us. I should mention that dual eligibles were included, uh, end stage renal dialysis patients were included, but Medicare Advantage patients were excluded. Uh, in New Hampshire, not a lot of Medicare Advantage patients, so we didn't have many excluded. Some of the other uh, participants had a lot of Medicare patients eliminated because of that exclusion criterion. Overall, we created a $34 million surplus over the four performance years, and that is including the 2% that Medicare took, um, of which we got $10.5 million over the four years. Uh, and also, we got credit for the full PQRI fulfillment over that time, which was an additional $3 million for us. Um, we got most of the, the bonus pool that was eligible for us to receive because our quality scores ranged in the 92 to 98 percent level for the four-year time frame. Next slide, please. So uh, how did we get started uh, doing this? The first thing was to understand the population. Um, we did receive some uh, reports on uh, the conditions that our population had. You can see on this slide what uh, there was. Not surprisingly, lots of chronic illness. In our case, lots of comorbidity. Um, and so that helps us say, okay, we know where we need to target uh, clinical quality improvement, clinical pathways. Um, we also looked at where our population was having the health expenditures incurred. Um, and I should mention it was all costs excluding pharmacy. So pharmacy not in, everything else in. Uh, and in our case, a lot was being spent to the hospital both for inpatient and outpatient services. So uh, that led to a lot of um, thinking about the care transitions, discharge planning, stepping down, use of transitional care uh, units. Next slide, please. Uh, what did we do internally uh, at, at sort of the delivery level? A, a big uh, part was trying to focus more attention on our diagnostic coding, our problem list, and our problem list maintenance. So we actually sort of did a traveling road show uh, to all of our primary care departments uh, throughout our system talking about the importance of this. Um, we also then identified internal best practice champions. They were sort of internal content experts. Uh, the physicians that were the most highly regarded, that had the most refer power, were the most successful at helping us roll out best, uh, best practice guidelines. But we felt it important to use our own clinicians. And then I think uh, an important piece was the transformation of the role of the RN. Now, um, we were fortunate in this case that we actually had RNs working in many of our departments. Uh, increasingly, a lot of practices don't have RNs. They have medical assistants. But we had RNs, and what they were primarily doing was they were on the phone doing telephone triage and often convincing patients they didn't really need to come in for an appointment. And what we realized was maybe a better approach would be to focus on care coordination health coaching, pre-visit planning. So we changed what we were looking to those nurses to do within our uh, delivery system. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, one of the key roles for the nurse was to provide support to the physician or the medical home around certain patient cohorts, uh, and they did that through uh, care gap identification and management. That was a key uh, responsibility for those uh, nurse coordinators. We were fortunate. Uh, we had good data capture. We had good analytic infrastructure. We've had a data warehouse that we've maintained for a number of years, and we certainly relied on that quite a bit. Uh, in, in uh, conducting our uh, work. One of the things we learned uh, was you have to stay relentless. So our four-year experience, we kind of got our feet on the ground the first year. Uh, second year, hit it out of the park, did really well, feeling really good. Third year, okay, maybe lost a little bit of ground, but still had a significant bonus. Kind of kicked back, maybe focused on some other relationships. And the fourth year, performance sagged. So now in our fifth year, you have to sort of ramp it back up. It's really hard to stay uh, relentless for just a subset of the total patient population that you're serving. And we found that um, reporting uh, and, and making reports available to the clinicians regularly was very important in kind of keeping them aware and remembering that, hey, this program's still going on. You know, it was a five-year program uh, for us. We did comparative reporting. Uh, I think Chet mentioned the power of that, uh, compared the performance of our medical homes. That certainly helped, I think. We also had added glance reporting, make it simple for the doctors. Um, and we had the reports right on the website, the Internet, for us, so the doctors could look up how they were doing every month and at any point in time. Um, one of the things that we did was to identify, and, and Medicare helped us with the identification of the high-risk patients. We called them the gold star patients. And these were patients that had a really high risk score, lots of comorbidity. They were highly vulnerable for cost and current. And we had some dedicated care management that we tried to focus on that particular population. Not a big number. Even of that 32,000, I think it was only a few hundred. But really trying to focus in on, uh, on that. The way the, the PGP program worked, Medicare looked at the top decile, decile the top 10% of the population by risk score, and they considered those high risk. And there were some performance measures that they looked at on that population. Uh, and we did aggressively use patient registries, which was a big part of uh, our management process. Next slide, please. So I don't know how well you can see this, but this is sort of an example of our preventive registry for adults. Uh, this was not by, this is across all uh, um, payers. But the point is we had identified what were the important things to do um, using our, uh, our guidelines and standards. If a patient didn't have something done, it got sort of uh, flagged. You can see it in red. And that was a cue that the next time you're encountering the patient, you need to do it. Or if you're not encountering the patient, the care coordinator, the nurse needs to contact them and arrange for that uh, care to be provided. Uh, and so that's just an example of some of the registry tools that we used. Next slide, please. So we felt pretty good about how this had gone, and, and it was, again, congruent with how we were uh, running our system anyway. So we then uh, uh, extended our knowledge, if you will, to a commercial payer relationship. Uh, and we uh, wanted to try to alter the traditional fee-for-service reimbursement with the commercial payer. We wanted support to continue to develop our patient-centered medical home. Uh, and we were looking to um, try some uh, a little bit of changes from the PGP uh, program. Next slide, please. Uh, so we uh, had one payer that uh, agreed to work with us, and this was, uh, I think we've just finished our third year. Um, a couple of the changes, the attribution was only on primary care provider evaluation and management codes. This commercial payer did not uh, uh, make you sign up for a PCP as part of their normal benefit structure. So PCPs weren't picked in advance, so we used an attribution algorithm to identify which ones were looking to the Dartmouth-Hitchcock system for their care. Uh, we shared on first dollar savings. We learned from PGP giving up the first 2% is tough. Uh, we also uh, had some quality metrics, a few changes. We tried to largely use the ones that we used with Medicare because we had a system in place to manage and report on them. But some of them really were not particularly good for primary care, particularly in an integrated multi-specialty group practice. Some of the coronary artery disease and heart 
uh, metrics. Quite honestly, our cardiology specialists ended up being more involved in managing that than our primary care physicians. So we made some alterations to be a little more focused on the primary care medical home. Um, this payer was willing to give us some payment to further develop our, uh, our medical homes, and that was very important to us. Um, we talked about having a, a PMPM care coordination. I think that was mentioned by one of the earlier speakers. We ended up just going with an enhanced payment for the E&M codes um, charged by primary care doctors. But point being that we had support uh, for that infrastructure uh, investment. Uh, and then the bonus methodology in our state, we needed to include the self-funded employers or the number of patients was just too small. So in this case, if we generated savings, the self-funded employers would get a piece of the savings as well as the payer and us as the delivery system. Next slide, please. So how did we do? We've just concluded our second year, our getting our results later this month. Um, we uh, uh, did develop some special reports, particularly more gaps in care. And in this case, the, the payer themselves gives us every month uh, care gap reports on the attributed members, which then go right into our registries to be worked by our medical home care coordinators. They also give us a notification of inpatient and emergency room usage, again, giving our care coordinators an opportunity to intervene uh, and find out what's, what's failing and why are these patients going in some cases the inpatients are needed. But some of the readmissions or the ERU, sometimes that's an indication of a delivery system failure. We wanted to be uh, notified of that. Um, based on this information, we then identified who we thought really needed some focused care management, and then we would contact them to try to help them navigate the, their health system needs. Um, continue to enhance the medical home. How did we do financially? Our total medical cost was between 98 and 99 percent uh, of the peer group. Um, <clears throat> here's a little thing: when you do this at the commercial payer level, uh, it included um, a mid-year rate increase to ourselves uh, because you know our cycle, our contract cycle, didn't line up with the ACO pilot, and so we had a mid-year increase. Obviously, that wasn't in the baseline cost, and you know, to the extent we get a bigger increase than our peer group, you have to do even better on the utilization side to earn a bonus. The nice thing about Medicare is it's sort of a common fee schedule for everyone. You don't have to worry about that as much. Um, our quality metric performance was slightly better than the comparison group. Overall, our performance, I would say, was decent, not a wow, certainly not as stellar as it was on the, uh, on the PGP side. We had about 19,000 members uh, under this uh, arra arrangement that was attributed to us. Next slide, please. So what could I share with you all on, on how this has sort of worked and felt to a delivery system? Um, I think the share savings model is a good model for ACO development. It's, um, it's upside risk only. So uh, at least you can't get hit. I lived through the managed care days. We, um, our delivery system had a lot of capitation. So we were used to bearing risk, but that doesn't mean it was comfortable. And it was nice to not have to worry too much about a downside. On the other hand, it does require an infrastructure investment. And how do you recoup that? You really need to make uh, your bonus or you're investing in a lot of costs that you don't get uh, recovered. Um, the large population is important um, to really have some credibility in the, in the, the cost of the population. So um, we were lucky. We had 32,000 Medicare, 19,000 in our commercial pilot. Uh, you saw that the PPACA legislation is talking about 5,000. We would say that's not a credible number. Um, I've talked to some other delivery systems. I think Geisinger looks to have 30,000 or more. Mayo would want to have 50,000 or more. We'll, we're okay at 15,000, but we're not okay at 5,000. Um, on the quality side, um, it's still more of a gate than an independent reward. You sort of got to save money before you get paid for quality. Kind of frustrating to a provider. I think, you know, obviously Elliot Fisher is part of the Dartmouth system. You know, he would say if you don't move cost, but you move quality a lot, you ought to get some kind of an economic reward. By and large, that doesn't happen with the shared savings program. So you don't save money, you don't get paid no matter how good your quality is. And our measures are still um, evolving from process, you know, did you do this, did you do a hemoglobin A1C, to outcomes. Was the hemoglobin A1C less than or equal to seven? Um, and again, the EMR development is gonna be critical in moving toward quality outcome measures, not just quality process. 
Next slide, please. Um, personally, I like uh, a system where you're compared to a peer group because it's better than chasing your tail. And those of you who remember the old managed care days, you did well, all of a sudden you're sitting down with a payer and your target just went down because, well, last year's cost was this, so you need to do better than that. And at least when you're comparing it to a, a peer group, if you're constantly and consistently beating the performance of the peer group, you're consistently earning bonus payment. That's kind of a nice thing, I think, for a delivery system that's committed. But you have to have risk adjustment. Um, obviously, as, a, as the state's only tertiary medical center with a lot of the subspecialties, we've always felt we were at risk for adverse selection. When we looked at the risk scores on the Medicare population compared to the peer group, sure enough, we had a riskier population year in, year out, and it only grew over the four uh, years of, of performance. So you've got to have risk adjustment if you're going to be compared uh, to a peer group, and you need outlier protection. Both our commercial and Medicare had $100,000 as outlier protection. Uh, in terms of the commitment, you've, you've heard this, you'll probably hear this throughout the day, um, uh, you need a pretty big investment. And so you have to really take a hard look at how that stacks up against uh, reward opportunity. Um, we were committed as a mission uh, for the organization and had a lot of infrastructure already involved. If we didn't have that, um, would we have done this? Yeah, we probably would have done this. Would we have been as successful? Not so sure. Because, you know, we had a leg up when we started in terms of the systems we had in place. We had lots of capitation experience. Just a point on the PGP performance, only four of the ten groups earned a consistent bonus. So there were years, you know, so it, it, it's a success for CMS, but it's not like all ten did great every year. Uh, there were years when uh, no money was earned by, by uh, some of the members. Uh, next slide, please. So hopefully I caught us up. Um, I probably won't talk uh, too much about the overall uh, performance of the, of the uh, other members. Just a couple things. Um, there is a 2.0 version to the PGP demonstration project, and I believe, I think all of the 10 members are going to participate. It's kind of getting worked out right now, but there are some changes and some refinements. Attribution based on primary care E&Ms, that's a good thing. Um, uh, new cohorts, frail elderly is one new cohort that's going to be looked at. Transitions in care, there will be some metrics. Um, changing a little bit of the way the quality bonuses uh, work, but not in a severe way, I think in a, in a reasonable, rational way, making some composite metrics. Um, and I believe that it's going to end up being a national peer group now that will be the comparison group as opposed to uh, those clinicians within the service area of the various uh, participants. So I'm going to keep us on time, and I know one of the keys of being a speaker before break is don't cut into break time. So I don't know. I think now we take a break. Larry, yeah. anything else to say? Yeah. And thank back in thank you very minutes. much. Thank you, Kevin. That was a great presentation. We'll, we'll now take uh, a 10-minute break, or make, maybe we'll make it an 8-minute break and get back on schedule. Thank you. Ah, I thought I did it.
Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Um, presenting now from Foley's Orlando office is Dr. Len Fromer, Executive Medical Director, the Group Practice Forum. Dr. Uh, Dr. Fro Froman's, uh, Fromer's presentation is ACOs, the Physician Perspective. Dr. Fromer. Well, thank you very much. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, depending upon where you are listening from or sitting at. It's a pleasure to be here. My role here in looking at the overall agenda, I think, is to really bring to you what are my colleagues thinking about. I'm a family physician, been so for 30 years, worked in a variety of settings, uh, mostly in the large group setting. So I want to bring to you what's on our minds, what are we doing as uh, clinicians delivering care to the patients and how are we thinking about ACOs and medical home issues. So you bring up my first slide. I wanted to start with a Darwin quote. And I think doctors are really tuned into this. Uh, they realize, we realize, that it's not about being smart. It's not about uh, power. It's about adaptability. It's about survival and thriving from adapting. We know that. Next slide. What that leads to is the recognition and the feeling in every one of us as physicians, particularly those of us in my vintage, you've been around quite a while, we know that there is change happening in healthcare that we have never seen in our practice lifetimes, except if we were practicing when Medicare started in the late 1960s. We know that's in front of us. We know it's on our doorstep. We know it's going to happen. We're struggling to figure out what do we do about it? What do we do about being proactive about it? Next slide. So what I wanted to do is really take you through um, quickly a little bit of the accountable care drivers and what it looks like. We've already covered some of that, but I wanted to just do it from the physician perspective particularly. And as you see, no surprise, my colleagues are thinking about accountable care, that it's going to be driven by the clinicians. It's going to be driven by the providers, not the payers. That change occurs right in front of the patient, in the exam room, decisions being made on diagnosis and therapeutics, that we have a fragmented system that requires a tremendous amount of heavy lifting every day to get the job done with our patients, that we have to change that. It has to be integrated. It has to be coordinated. But on our level, when we see the patients and the services and the goods we try to provide, that it's coordinated care, it's efficient care. We have too much variability in what we do, what we do as doctors and how we make decisions. We have to remove that variability. It's on our mind. We know it's there even in one of us from patient to patient, but across doctors in a group, across groups in a region, and across regions in our country. We know if this is fundamentally about moving from a volume-based to a value-based system. We know that's what this means. However, we're not sure how to do that. And we certainly don't have in place yet, in most settings, uh, almost all settings, the systems and the care grids and the tools that we need to make that transition happen. Policymakers understand this. We know that policymakers recognize that the cost equation flows from the decisions I make and my colleagues make in front of our patients. The question is, what are the policymakers going to do about that, and how do we influence that so that we put quality improvement first and cost reduction from that second in the accountable care uh, algorithm? Next slide, please. So what you're looking at here, again, highlighted uh, in my slide, are the components of the principles of the Campbell Care you've seen already, but really from the physician's eyes and mind. So we think healthcare is local, and in fact it is. Things differ in different regions, in different towns. There's, there's uh, input into that system locally that matters greatly in how our care is delivered, that uh, we can be held accountable. We have to be measured appropriately for that with metrics that matter that we're going to look at in a minute, uh, that process, that, again, the big, big issue for us is to move to a coordinated system so we don't have heavy lifting to get the job done. That's the big challenge. That is every day foremost from when we turn the lights on to when we turn the lights off. We're getting the job done now uh, efficiently, no. Uh, easily, no. Lots of heavy lifting in a fragmented system, not team-based collaborative care, lots of weight on the shoulders of the people in the white coats that we have to offload 
let everybody work up to the level of their licensure. It's one of our mottos in moving to change and solving these problems. Um, that we're not efficient now, that we, we don't put quality first and cost second many times, that financial issues get in the way, that we don't have yet an alignment with getting this job done and being accountable for quality and cost with the contracts we have in place, which still recognize almost universally that we're paying on volume. So how do we change that and move forward? But we also know that accountable care fundamentally has it a foundation that we have to give comprehensive care, that we have to measure it and be reliable in those measures, be safe in what we deliver to the patient, and that it has to be reproducible. Next slide. So when we look at this playing out over this question about clinical performance measurement, it's one of the fundamental issues that we struggle with. We can't have extra work added to what we do to measure our quality. If we do that, it's more heavy lifting. It's more of a load. It's going to be unsustainable. Therefore, what we realize as, as physicians and the forward-looking groups that, that my network uh, does programs with, what we do is we build in and know that we have to embed in the workflow redesign the ability to measure how well we're doing, not an add-on, but it's built in as a byproduct of the care flow process that we redesign, particularly around chronic illness. That evidence has to drive those metrics, that those metrics have to be measured, have to be reportable, they have to be understood on the same level playing field by everybody, that we can feed uh, individual metrics into group metrics, into regional, and then compare it against benchmarks nationally and know that we're doing a better job or not. Um, we don't know what best performance is yet. Nobody knows. We know about best practices based upon some translational research that we have, but we need to do a lot more of that. Next slide. What we also know about measurement is that when we select what we're going to use as our metrics, we have a panoply of organizations out there that are providing or um, uh, developing measures that don't always match up within disease states. And that's a problem for doctors. It's a big issue on our minds. We have NCQA, we have NQF, we have the metric program from AFP, we have the AMA consortium. All of this, uh, all of these different measure develop, measurement developments uh, make it a problem for us. Which ones do we target? Which ones do we use? Good news is I represent primary care in a series of commissions and committees where we are literally sitting down with all the measurement development organizations and starting to have a process to make that uh, uniform, to, con to have conformity within a disease state about what everybody agrees should be the quality metrics that we use. We have to have local health care deliver local quality improvement, practice improvement, so measures have to be uh, adjusted sometimes for local issues. They have to be inside the workflow. We already said that. And how do we do this efficiently? We're going to talk in the next few minutes about a registry function. Uh, a piece of technology within the EMR, or if we don't have an EMR, an application that attaches to an EMR and is interoperable, that registries are fundamental in being able to embed efficient um, measurement, uh, the process of that, and then continuous quality improvement. On the next slide, what we have uh, when we look at improving quality and measures is that we have to fundamentally look at the process eliminating waste, being efficient, removing delays, coordinating care, managing the transition across different levels of care. Fantastically important issues. Doctors are aware of that, struggling with how do we do that and how do we get it done. So we have to be able to present to the care teams at our fingertips a way to look at this what we call a dashboard of information that gives us what we need, when we need it efficiently. That's what we want most from the technology, to plot that out, to do rapid improvement cycles, continuously improve, sample our techniques, develop new ways to approach it, and most importantly, a lot of doctors we talk to say, if it's not enjoyable to do, if we don't approach it as quality improvement being a journey rather than a destination, you know, we're never going to be perfect, but the journey has to be enjoyable and fun to do. We can't get our care teams to stick with it. We can't get our collaborative processes to happen and continuous, continuously improve. That's a challenge. So on the next slide, I think I have a demonstration for you of a dashboard 
of information. And there it is. It's from Bay State Healthcare. And I love this one because it's one of the um, unique ones that uh, above that blue line, three, three quarters of the way down, where it says operating excellence, you have the clinical measures above that line, clinical quality measures that they plot in their system over time. These are called runtime analyses, and they're very fundamental in measure improvement and, and how do we implement this when we use our registries to get better. But you see effectiveness, mortality rates, safety issues, patient satisfaction scoring, and then below the line, the recognition that this can exist without being tied to financial operational excellence also. So they put it all on one dashboard. Anybody in the care team has their fingertips on this. They can look at, over time, how they are doing. They can plot themselves and their patient populations against the system and benchmark themselves. Very important to put it in one place. We think dashboards are critically important in doing uh, measure-driven quality improvement, practice improvement. That's what's on our minds as doctors. Next slide. What I want to do here is sum up the whole measure issue by saying that it's the foundation of everything we want to do in ACOs. It has to be efficient. We have to have dashboards to do this well. And we have to be transparent about it. Next slide. You can't manage what you can't measure. You can't get better. But what if we could do that? What if we put that all together with the list of bullet items you see up there, the bullet points you see, and we had everything at our fingertips, and we were able to know when we were in front of the patient, when we needed to know, all the information about the patient that we needed, all of the history, all of the objective findings, all of the lab data, all of the radiology information, accurately know what medications the patient was actually taking, have a medication reconciliation list, and it was accurate and up-to-date. What if we were able to take that and manage and coordinate the patient's care so it was not fragmented, and we used our technology to the capacity it had, that it was efficient, it was cost-effective? Well, then we would have, as we saw the patient, what we needed to deliver on the next slide, what we're calling and I'm calling and doctors are thinking about, being a medical village inside an ACO. So what does that concept mean? That means we deliver team-based collaborative care, that we coordinate it, that the team shares responsibilities in a task grid. I'll show you one in a few minutes. That we reach out into the community where the patient lives, works, plays, and goes to school. And we recognize that over 90% of the lives of our patients, even the sickest of the sick, do not take place inside the healthcare system. And if we don't connect to the community resources to get the job done, we're not going to be able to be concordant with what the patient needs to get great outcomes and, in fact, improve the patient experience also during their care process. So it's team-based care. It's technology that's seamlessly interoperable using standards that's inexpensive and cost-effective, that we all share this vision and we all align to get the same job done and every step of the way, every step of the way, every member of that care team is engaged in education, health literacy improvement in the patient so that we have an engaged, activated patient, not a passive recipient of instructions. That's the medical village. And if we move on to the next slide, we start to look at how do we put these pieces together. The medical home that so many of us know about and have heard about, the advanced primary care practice being a synonym for that, is that everybody has at the core of this, a personal physician trained to do continuous and comprehensive care that is in a physician-directed practice with a care team to help that happen, with PAs and nurse practitioners, with clinical and non-clinical staff, that we orient ourselves to everything about the patient, not one organ system or one disease, but everything about them that we need to, that we coordinate it, that we are driven by quality and safety, that we give advanced access, the patient gets what they need and what they want exactly when they need and want it, and that there is financial alignment in the payment model to recognize we're doing this, that we're providing value to the system and get rewarded for it. So there's your medical home principles. If you go to the next slide, what is at the essence and core of that in the center is this continuous healing relationship over time between a personal physician coordinating care 
for both wellness and illness. We have a sick care system, not a wellness care system now. Our country spends an enormous percentage more than other comparable countries. You saw the Commonwealth Fund data a little earlier about how we compare to other systems around the world. We spend much more of an enormous total amount of money on rescuing sick people and much less in our total spend on wellness, prevention, and chronic disease management in particular. Move to the next slide. What we try to do here is put the pieces together. What does a medical home look like? So you have the foundation of a primary care base, and on that we take the elements of having quality improvement built into the care flow process, measuring it and continuously improving it, being completely and fundamentally about patient service and patient centeredness and the patient experience and how we organize the practice to deliver care, using health information technology to the utmost to make it efficient, to make it accurate, to make it safe, and that all of that has to take place in an efficiently well-run, what is essentially a small business in practice, even if you're in a large group, that that practice management component of the financial management, the legal management, the human resource management, that all of that is very efficient and managed well. Put the pieces together and you've got great outcomes, not just in the process of care or in the disease outcome of care, but think about the great outcomes for everyone involved in that care process in addition to the patient. So you're thinking about the clinicians and the staff supporting the clinicians. And I'm very happy to report that in the level three functioning medical homes that have been recognized out there, that there is some very interesting data that turnover of staff in those settings has dropped dramatically, that the staff enjoys once the change turmoil has happened and they're into a, an implemented culture change functioning medical home, that staff loves it, turnover drops, everyone is engaged, great outcomes includes that. On the next slide, if we then put more pieces together and look at how this plays out when we put that into the accountable care clinical integration model, the highlight again from the physician perspective, care is continuous and comprehensive. It's physician directed. It's about the whole person. It's coordinated across all elements of that very complex health system and out into the community the patient lives in. It is about quality and safety from the get-go, fundamentally, and we offer it with advanced access. Patients get what they need, get what they want, exactly when they need and want it. That payment recognizes all of that. So bottom line is better care, best price, delivery of value. That's kind of where we put all this together in our minds as a physician, a clinician saying, well, what's this ACO concept all about? On the next slide, if we're going to go ahead and we're going to do that, then the system strategies for what we build, an organization to do that, an ACO. So what are the strategies that you're looking at there that systems have to think about? Patients have to have access to primary care. That primary care access has to focus completely like a laser beam on integration, care coordination, measuring and being transparent and accountable for that quality and cost issue. That we have to take the technology we have and leverage it, and we have to do it all based upon what the science tells us is the right thing to do diagnostically and therapeutically. So those are the four elements if I was running a system to develop an ACO that I wanted to pay attention to. And as we kind of dissect that and play it out on the next slide, we start to look at this, where does primary care fit into all of this? Well, from the health system perspective, there's a rethinking about the role of primary care if I'm in a health system uh, mode. Improved clinical quality comes from more primary care access, doing the right thing at the right time all the time. The economics work, that when the system payment model is adjusted and blended to recognize quality improvement, to recognize value delivery, the, the, net, the economics absolutely work, that physician satisfaction in that system becomes much better, that from the moment we start every day to we end every day, Alignment occurs so that the current collision between delivering clinical quality and the payment model that's out there now becomes an intersection that's navigated with much more success, driven by the same things we all want to accomplish, that it all makes sense when we put it together. And most importantly, that the patient experience 
in this system model with primary care as the foundation, that the patient experience and patient satisfaction through that care process dramatically improves because the patients are getting good care coordination. They have nurse navigation maps. They have care teams to help them. That the patient identifies with that happening. And uh, we had a presentation from Dartmouth Hitchcock. Dartmouth has done great research showing that the patients recognize almost immediately when we start to make these changes. They don't have a finger on exactly what it is, but they recognize it feels a heck of a lot better and they like it a heck of a lot more when we start to move in this direction, even from the beginning of moving down the path of accountability. On the next slide, if we're going to build this system and we have this perspective about primary care, then we have to view primary care in a new light. So it's an extension of the mission of whatever that organization is up to to have primary care as the basis of this. It is a financially sustainable entity. Economics do work out. It's a buffer against assuming risk in the future and managing that risk as an ACO. And it is the vehicle that we can drive through this treacherous water of integration across the care continuum. There's lots of stakeholders out there. There's lots of potholes on that road. The vehicle to get there, primary care at the base of an ACO development, uh, we think that's going to be the future. That is the present and the future. And we have to do it across populations. It's not across a patient only, but population-based, disease state management-based methods. Next slide. What we are leading to here in developing all this is the structure of what this is going to look like. So what does it look like and sound like from MedPAC's point of view? So here's the MedPAC definition. Um, it's a combination of a hospital and primary care and maybe specialists, integrated care, PHOs, or hospital and multi-specialty groups, or hospital and independent practices, but it's a defined population of patients, who are, and, the, and the care is accountable, accountable for quality first, total spending second, and it's across that population that we're defining. On the next slide, we have some other, uh, another look at this from another angle. Well, if you look at the current challenges that we face and how we have to develop health policy that face that challenges, I have a schematic here of an umbrella being bombarded by uh, very confusing aims in the current challenges in our current system. Measurement that's not there are very poor. Incentives that are misaligned. Fragmented care. What do ACOs do? It addresses every one of these things. Blended payment models, bundled payments, partial or full capitation, other methods of recognizing value delivery. Reform efforts fit very well with ACO. They strengthen each other. The medical home is the foundation of all of this. Using technology to get the job done. All of it fits beautifully. On the next slide. Some of the structure we want to look at, if we think about the issue of integrating care, and we have an ACO, you have it on the upper left there. Inside that ACO, there are pieces missing. You can't have everything that you need to deliver the care we want to deliver inside the ACO, so it interconnects through the health plans in this model with other providers outside the ACO through contracting to deliver all of those goods and services that are necessary. And then on the bottom, what you see here are the issues about moving away from rescuing only sick people to wellness initiatives to reach out into the population and the community services to bring that all to bear together. On the next slide, we start to dissect, well, what does this look like from the physician perspective depending upon how all of it's organized, we're going to need tools to do this. You can't do this with the current way we're organized and the things we use on a macro level to deliver this care and do the contracting process. What you're looking at here is one of the new tools that's available. It's a web-based tool called Open Health Market. And what it does is give a place on the web for purchasers to float an RFP with defined metrics for quality and cost and have providers in that healthcare universe of goods and services respond in a secure private way. So it enables a market-driven solution to healthcare that is not out there now. So it, it, it's a wonderful example of a tool that's, that's now already available that is going to need to be there to allow this process of an ACO development to happen and to have the players involved 
really negotiate that contracting, that intersection between clinical and payment, all of that happening in this open health market forum. Next slide, if we start to look at, well, what are the different ways doctors organize and how does it play out in the ACO model, here's an IPA-based physician organization building an ACO, and you see inside the ACO there in the yellow box, you have just the doctors either organize a solo small group or multi-specialty group having contracts outside the ACO with the government entities, with health plans, with HMOs. On the next slide, suppose it is an integrated health system or a PHO. Well, now you have the hospital inside the ACO, different issues, uh, different approach to things legal issues that come up, financial issues that come up. But outside of that, again, contracting with the government, with CMS, contracting with external payers, and so forth. The third kind of large way to look at doctor organization is basically uh, on the next slide. This one is organized as if doctors were in kind of loosely organized positions in a town or a region or a metro area. Uh, building an ACO with having an administrative organization as the hub, and then you have lots of things outside the ACO. You've got the hospital, you've got ancillary services, and you've got the contracted uh, large payers and self-funded employers and so forth. So each of these have different things involved with development, issues about legal, issues about financial. Uh, bottom line on each one, how the doctors are organized really will determine what that ACO looks like, and how to approach it. That's what's on our minds. How do I organize myself as a physician in my practice to, to really think about the future? And if I'm going to develop a model uh, in partnership with somebody, where do we stand? Where do I stand and my practice stand, my group stand? Where do we stand in that development structure? Next slide. <clears throat> if we look at moving towards accountability, we are right now on the left, we have a prospective payment system. On the right, all the way on the right, full global risk capitation. So the axis there, left to right, the horizontal axis is more and more accountability. And you see steps along the way. And if you just kind of advance the uncover here, we have a slide build. Uh, go ahead and click a few times. We should see, there you go. So we have uh, what's going on today. Uh, I think one more click what's going on tomorrow, what's going on upcoming in years 2013 and beyond, and how it plays out along the accountability spectrum of assuming risk and the payment model that goes along with that. That's the path we are on. This comes from the advisory board. And then you've already heard a lot of great uh, analysis of the legal issues as we move down that path of accountability about some of the current regulatory issues and the need to have relief to those, flexibility in those, and, and uh, so forth. Uh, next slide. So the payment methodology to the doctors is really very much on our radar screens as physicians. Our perspective on ACO, uh, a lot of it, a lot of the thinking is about, well, how are we going to be paid? What is actually going to be the methodology to go ahead and pay us for delivering this value-based, measured-based care? Well, it could be enhanced fees of service. It could be extra fees for managing care. It could be a capitation. You've heard about the shared savings model already. Uh, there's targeted incentives. There's, P there's pay for performance. There's organizational accountable care. And there are um, incentives coming from the government. The issue at the bottom of all of this, the, the root of all of this is, physicians recognize very early on that if the financial alignment is not uh, there with what we're being asked to do, it becomes an unsustainable proposition to be able to do the heavy lifting and still get paid for volume delivery. System-wise, it won't continue to happen successfully. And one of the embedded issues with that happens to be the, uh, the way that we account for and measure what we do, the way that we design our processes of care, the way we make decisions about care of the patient, recognizing that those decisions really fundamentally drive resource utilization. So all of that has to fit together. And one thing that physicians have become acutely aware of, no one of these bullets 
and on the next slide if you advance, no one of the um, methodologies will be the answer. It's got to be a blend. It's got to be some shared savings. It's got to be some paper performance. It's got to be maintaining fee-for-service. That's not going to go away, and so forth and so on. If you go to the next slide, beyond shared savings, you look at some of the uh, global bundle payment methodologies that we're looking at. That's going to be part of the system. If you go to the next slide, when you look at internally in the practice, what are the payment methods that come to bear on the compensation level of the physicians wearing the white coats and the clinicians? Well, doctors know that, and we've got this data when we do our work in my network, we know that when there is a change in the payment structure to a group, to an integrated system, to a PHO, that if there is not a concurrent internal change in the compensation formula for the providers of care that matches that, that recognizes that, then it becomes very unsustainable. The groups that have done internal compensation formula change to recognize the movement towards value-based delivery away from volume, they're the ones that get, this is what the data shows, they're the ones that get the highest scores in the paper performance program. They end up in the top decile. It's not an accident. There's a linear relationship with how much they change their internal compensation to match the revenue stream flow to the entity that they work for. Next slide. What I wanted to finish up with is let's just quickly look at what's the clinical model as we deliver this that fits what we're describing as the structure and the fundamentals about ACOs. And what we call it is the patient pathway. And it recognizes, recognizes those five bullet points as being fundamental. We're going to move away from what I call the tyranny of the urgent. That, that's what we have now. We're driven every day by rescuing sick people. And we're going to move towards prevention and wellness, chronic disease management, population management within disease states and comorbidities, collaborative-based care teams, and we're going to focus like a laser beam completely in how we develop these processes on the patient needs, the patient desires, and the patient experience. So what we come up with on the next slide is this macro look at what we call the patient pathway. Based completely on the chronic care model, this was presented by Ed Wagner back in the mid-1990s to the U.S. Congress when he was talking about how to fix broken health care. And what you see are the fundamentals here that we've been talking about that up above those horizontal red lines, you have the health system existing within the reality of the community the patient lives in, that we have inside the health system a universe of goods and services and stakeholders that have to be addressed, but we have to do it by using technology, having better decision support to make diagnostic and therapeutic choices. The design of the system matters greatly, and the patients have to move fundamentally from being passive recipients of care to informed, activated patients with a fire lit under them. We have to be able to help them do that and that they manage themselves in conjunction with our help from a prepared, proactive, collaborative care team. That's how we get great outcomes. And on the next slide, the big kind of 10,000-foot level of what the pathways look like is in front of you. Left to right is a horizontal timeline, and everything in those boxes is all about what we need at our fingertips when we deliver care. You move to the next slide, we drill down into this and look at a typical chronic disease model of that patient pathway and the map through care in the system. On the left is diagnosis, and as we move to the right, time. So you see here a patient going through three visits in a chronic care, regular plan care model. And what's in the boxes that you don't have to struggle to read are all of these steps about the clinical process that we need to change. Having a dashboard of information in front of us, driven by knowing that we have a coordinated care team effort, that the, the, the foundation of all of this is that we empower the patient, we improve their health literacy, we manage the population, not just that one patient, and we know from our technology how we're doing. And in those boxes are steps along the way. Much of it visit to visit, not just at each visit, that there's activity going on in this accountable care model that between two office visits, 
that we are contacting the patient through asynchronous communication, email, fax, telephone, that there are care team members who use the dashboard of information on the next slide. I'll show you what that looks like. Typical dashboard of information on a patient at diagnosis and at six-week visit for chronic illness. That we have this, this set of metrics that we need to know, that we can use it for better clinical decision support, and that not just the doctor has it, but every care team member has it, so that when my nurse calls a patient who's made a visit about their diabetes, about their COPD, about their CHF, that the next day they get a routine call from a care team member, not me, and that outbound call is all about, did you understand what happened yesterday? Do you have any questions? Did you get your medication? Was there any problem picking it up? Do you understand how to use it? Any side effects from it? That patient adherence skyrockets because of concordance with the life they're leading outside of the four walls of our office. And on the next slide, we take this dashboard of information, we use the care team process, and put together a grid that for a disease state, for a given patient, for a population of patients with that disease, who's on the care team and who's going to do what in that map of the patient journey of care so that each person on that team knows their responsibilities, the team works together, there's good communication, everyone takes their role, checks the box, fills in the date, we do it electronically or on paper, it doesn't matter, either way works, but you've got a defined tool along with checklists, along with software that's, that we've developed that's very simple to help the patient get through this process. That's how you enable the development of an ACO medical home model and implement disease across a, uh, a care across a disease state beyond the culture change and the framework change of what we've all been talking about. So I wanted to show you a little flavor of that and on the next slide as we finish up. What it becomes is what are the expectations in clinical integration for the physician driven by what we realize works to change this experience every day in the care of the patients in this new model. You see the bullets there for what we've been talking about. Team bake, everybody functions up to the level of their licensure, better flow of data and communication using technology, do the right thing every time, all the time, patients at the center of everything, and we are measuring, we are accountable, and we are transparent and comparing ourselves to benchmarks at every step of the way with that process of measurement built right into the care process, not an add-on extra. So on the next slide, in conclusion, what we do with all of that is realize that it leads to improved outcomes. In all of those issues you see up there, not just better quality outcomes, but across chronic diseases, managing the transition to care, improving patient satisfaction, dramatic improvements in efficiency and cost reductions in the system that really plummet when we get all of this happening and all the cylinders firing at the right time across a population of patients. Next slide. Will we succeed? Will ACOs be the answer? We don't know. As Ian Morrison said, we have undefined, uh, an undefined animal out there. We have a unicorn. We don't know what it looks like. We don't have the rules yet. The possibility is there. Is it our best effort at this point? Doctors, I think, realize that we think it is, that it's the fundamental change we've been looking for for a long time, that we combine all these moving pieces and that it has the best chance to succeed over time given how, how our system has been organized before. Look uh, at the next slide, and essentially what I want to say to everybody is the bottom line that we know about, the bottom line for clinicians is we have to deliver every day on value. It's quality divided by cost. We have to deliver the maximum numerator. We have to reduce the denominator as much as we can, maximum value. On the last slide, the only way we're going to get there is to have leadership. That leadership is across all levels of our organizations. Physician, clinical staff, non-clinical staff, financial, legal, all kinds of leadership has to be there. In the doctor sector, there's a, a big question about who's going to lead the physician piece of this through this turmoil and change. That's a challenge, and I hope we'll get to that during the Q&A, but it's 
clearly recognize that leadership has to be there and, and be a part of this. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to say thank you very much, and I'll be back and see you at the Q&A. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fromer. Uh, up next from our Los Angeles office is Judy Vaccaro, Managing Senior Associate General Counsel of WellPoint, and she's going to talk about ACO from the payer perspective. Judy? Thank you, and I'm excited to be here to talk about something that's generated a lot of interest at my company, WellPoint. And I'm also kind of excited to be here because I'm an attorney, but I don't have to talk about the legal issues today. I have the privilege of leading a group of attorneys who support WellPoint's provider engagement and contracting a team, which stretches across the country in our 14 WellPoint states, which roughly includes from west to east, California, Nevada, Colorado, Missouri, Wisconsin, Kentucky, Indiana, Ohio, Georgia, Virginia, New York, Connecticut, New Hampshire, and Maine. So as you can see from that recitation, there's a great deal of variety in the markets that WellPoint serves. So I'm here to talk about what I believe is not only our perspective on ACOs, but what I believe is the perspective of a lot of our uh, payer competitors as well. So why payment innovation? I don't need to tell this audience why we need to take another look at the current state of our delivery system reimbursement models. We have to, it's, it's time. We have to look at something different. We have to address the rising cost of care, the provider incentive to focus on volume and intensity of services as opposed to quality and efficiency, the increased pressure that we're getting from our employer community to do something about it, and last but not least, we've got this new healthcare law out there that's sort of jump-starting some of the industry's efforts in this regard. As you know, and as you've heard earlier today, CMS is charged with implementing Section 3022 of the Affordable Care Act, through which groups of providers meeting the criteria specified by the Secretary may work together to manage and coordinate care for Medicare beneficiaries through an ACO. Also, as you know, Section 1321 of the Affordable Care Act establishes a Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation within CMS, which is authorized to test innovative payments and service delivery models to reduce program expenditures while preserving or enhancing the quality of care rendered to Medicare beneficiaries. In both of these efforts, CMS is seeking to advance the ACO structure. Well, we're all wondering when the CMS regulations are going to come out, um, which what they're going to look like. Well, hopefully we'll see them soon. But CMS is, of course, focused on Medicare, and payers in the provider community are not waiting for CMS to blaze the trail. To the contrary, payers and providers are already out there blazing their own trails with ACOs and other innovative payment methodologies for the commercial population. The bottom line here, as you all know, there is no new money. So we have to collectively figure out a way to stretch that healthcare dollar as far as we can to be more efficient in everything that we do along the healthcare continuum, yet at the same time ensuring that the quality of care does not decline. Status quo is not working. The only way we're going to succeed is, is to try something new, to forge new partnerships and link arms, payers and providers together in a collaborative way that perhaps hasn't been done before. I can say that we in the private sector completely and wholeheartedly embrace the aim, uh, the, the achievement of CMS's triple aim of better care, better health, and lower cost. Our large employer clients are increasingly coming to us with their own ideas how we can achieve this. They also have been partnering with external groups that, that are coming up with even more ideas, just pushing us continually to be more innovative to keep the cost down on their behalf. The market pressure in that regard has ratcheted up considerably. And it's important to note that this ACO concept is not a contracting strategy for us. We need to look carefully at each entity that's interested in becoming an ACO partner with us to be sure that it's got the right infrastructure to do it. We also need to be sure that there is going to be a savings opportunity. Notwithstanding that, we are planning to build reimbursement around quality first. But if we can impact the cost of care, we can impact premiums. The fact of the matter is we can't do nothing because what we're currently experiencing, the skyrocketing cost of care trend, is just not sustainable. A couple of other points before returning to my slides. First, we are wholeheartedly behind giving this a try. But at this point in time, 
as you've heard earlier, we don't know if it's going to succeed or fail. And if it succeeds, how successful? Is it going to be a rip-roaring success or only modest improvements or gains? We really need to convene this group in a year from now because only time will tell. Second, payment innovation. You've heard a bit more about that earlier. It's not just about ACOs. We are opening to starting small and unlimited markets and testing different payment options short of ACOs, such as bundled payments. The Accountable Care Act also has a provision that establishes a demonstration project to allow for bundled payments starting in 2011, 2012. There's a lot of groundwork that has to be done before jumping into something seemingly as simple as a, as a bundled payment without a corresponding benefit design. By that, uh, as by way of example, we could pay a bundled payment for a total knee replacement, but that's necessarily going to include the physical therapy that's uh, required at the end of the surgery. But what if the member has already reached his limit on physical therapy uh, at that point? What do we do? So we need to be working carefully and quickly on benefit designs that will, that will feed into some of these new innovative ways. The Act also has a provision regarding the establishment of community health teams to support the patient-centered medical home. And all of these strategies can include additional rewards and or penalties related to quality of care goals, efficiency of care goals, and other aspects of the of, uh, care or care outcomes. The best reforms to pursue will vary depending on market conditions, such as type of provider organization present, other available delivery system infrastructures, and the success of any current payment initiatives. So there's a, there are a lot of options, but this is about ACOs, so that's what we're going to focus on. Next slide. ACO features. Bullet number one, this is where we'd like to end up in an ideal world with the ACO accepting full risk for a defined population. Well, to get there, we're going to need a methodology for attributing or assigning PPO members to the ACO, keeping in mind that at this point in time, we don't have any product designs that would keep the member with that particular ACO. He or she is still going to be free to stay with the ACO's providers or decide to seek care elsewhere. We're probably going to use the ETG or episode treatment group methodology to attribute patients to the ACO. ETG is a treatment classification system that identifies discreetly occurring episodes of care. There'll be some flexibility in determining the percent of time that the member has seen a particular physician in order to qualify as an ACO member. That percent will determine the size of the ACO's population and it'll also reflect the degree of risk that that member will go outside the ACO. The arrangement naturally must include incentives to improve quality and cost efficiency and it's simply not going to work without both. And the only way it's going to work is to increase the data sharing to a level that we haven't, we haven't experienced before. Next slide. ACO provider options. We at WellPoint are opening, open as to the type of provider entity or combination that might be interested in contracting with us as an ACO. And the options on this slide are pretty, pretty similar to those that are put forth by CMS. To tell you, we're getting at least two to three inquiries per month from groups. And when I say groups, I don't that mean physician groups and entities that want to partner with us, seriously want to partner with us as ACOs. We're finding that everyone wants to get started in 2011 because the ACOs want to be up and running and ready to participate in the CMS Medicare ACO program in 2012. Next slide. Potential payment models. This is sort of a, give you an example of some ways that we may ramp up with an ACO on reimbursement. As was discussed earlier, there are many legal constraints about what can be done, both in terms of how providers can work in combination as an ACO and how and to whom compensation can flow. You heard about antitrust laws, physician self-referral prohibitions, federal anti-kickback statutes, civil monetary penalty law, and licensure issues. The preferred structure will depend in large part on the particular market, and WellPoint as a national company needs to be flexible with our approach. And we definitely want to be sure to give the ACO the opportunity to grow into the job of taking risk. Not to force it early on, but instead going gradually where we think it's prudent. Both sides, payer and ACO, need to be equally invested in each other's financial well-being to make this work. 
So you can see from this slide some options we're contemplating in the evolution of the model over the, over the five-year period of the contract, and we are looking for a five-year commitment from each of our ACO partners. Option one starts with a fee-for-service payment in year one with a reconciliation against the medical budget, progressing over a uh, period of years till you get to year five, global per member per month payment with a full risk-sharing arrangement. Option two starts out with a global PMPM in year one, and again, this is not going to be appropriate for all ACO entities, uh, partial risk sharing, and then it again progresses to year five global PMPM with a full risk sharing uh, arrangement, ending up at the same place as option number one. For those of you in the audience from California, I can contrast this to the capitated HMO model that we have here, which does have similarities to ACOs. Some of you in California may be saying ACOs, been there, done that in California, but there are differences, the largest of which, of course, is the difference between PPO and HMO patients. Remember, we're starting this in California uh, and throughout the country without any corresponding benefit designs. So HMO patients, of course, they're required to attain care from a particular subset of providers. PPO patients are not. Even worse, or worse for this situation, most, if not all, of our PPO products have out-of-network benefits, meaning that members can obtain covered services not only from providers that aren't in the ACO, but from providers that have no contractual or any relationship with the ACO or us as a health plan. HMO members, they have a gatekeeper to guide them through the health care continuum, and PPO patients, of course, don't. And again, we're, st we're starting this without the benefit of a benefit design that links that member to that ACO. Our ACO partnership, it's a long-term partnership. We're talking five years, which is longer than the typical two-year contract with an, an HMO physician group. With an ACO, we'll be sharing data at a level that's not done in the HMO setting. Also, with most straight capitation models in the commercial setting, there's no additional revenue for taking sicker patients, and payment is made regardless of quality. In ACOs, there will be the opportunity to uh, risk adjust the payment, and there will be bonuses and penalties based on quality metrics. So this is a complete sea change for the PPO population, which, which I have to say is currently experiences a much higher utilization than the HMO population. So that has really piqued our interest and that of other payers. In the case of physician-centered and physician-run ACOs, we're hoping that some of the characteristics that are used by the HMO groups in California to manage patient care will be translated to the PPO population to the benefit of everyone. And finally, it's important to emphasize that we want the ACOs to assume both upside and downside risk. Upside risk, of course, is where both the ACO and the payer share in any amount that's left over after the actual cost of services is compared to the target or benchmark. Similarly, downside risk is where both sides are on the hook for any amounts that the actual cost exceed the targeted amount. And although the Affordable Care Act compensates or contemplates a, a bonus-only situation, meaning upside only, even MedPAC recognizes a need for the dual approach, both upside and downside, in its November comment letter to HHS. Next slide. Next slide, please. ACO criteria, which should come up in a moment. Our, our criteria for considering a group as a potential ACO pilot are again in line um, with what CMS has in mind, but we are looking at a larger 15,000 member uh, minimum as our ideal. Obviously, the legal and regulatory issues need to be ironed out, and the structure is likely going to be market specific. Within the ACO structure itself, ACOs will probably vary widely with respect to the elements of care that the ACO delivers directly. Some may include a full range of services, including a variety of subspecialists, hospitals, home health, and other ancillary providers, while others will be more narrowly structured, but will maintain active relationships and contracts with providers necessary to provide the full complement of services to the ACO patients. Next slide. The ACOs will need to show us at the beginning a demonstrated plan for reducing medical costs. And this could include a network of hospitalists, discharge planners, case managers, techniques typically already deployed in the HMO managed care setting. 
Adequate IT resources will be essential, and to go with that, we're requiring an electronic medical record system, which I think everyone today has acknowledged is going to be necessary uh, to really clinically, uh, the clinical integration level that we're going to need and the sharing of information across the organization. Well, commitment from senior leadership, that's crucial because, again, this is going to be a five-year relationship. And although one never knows if the same leaders are going to be around five years from now, we certainly need to get their buy-in at the highest levels at the outset. Our strategy is going to be to contain costs and reduce the use of unnecessary services while encouraging integration and coordination of those services. Now, we're not the only ones looking at criteria. You may have noticed that NCQA came out with draft qualifying criteria and monitoring criteria last October, and they asked for public comments to be submitted to them by mid-November. Their qualifying criteria are a set of core capabilities that an entity needs to demonstrate to be recognized as an ACO. Uh, organizations would need to meet these criteria at the outset, and then they would be uh, reviewed against them every two to three years. Their proposed seven areas to be evaluated are program structure operations, access and availability, primary care, care management, care coordination and transitions, patient rights and responsibilities, and performance reporting. Their monitoring criteria are areas of focus of performance, reporting, and benchmarking. They include cl clinical quality, patient experience, and cost measures. Organizations would be required to collect and publicly report these measures at least annually. We expect to see NCQA's final standards sometime in mid-2011. Next slide. The ACO evaluation process, the next two slides go through some of the areas that we need to explore when evaluating a potential ACO arrangement, and they're pretty self-explanatory. I'll go over them quickly. We need to establish what lines of business will be, that will be encompassed by the arrangement. I can tell you in our California experience, there some of the groups we're talking to uh, just want the group population. Other and do not want the individual population. Others are saying, sure, give me the group and the individual. Uh, then there's the all-important uh, member attribution methodology It needs to be decided. We need to look at medical management opportunities, how and what and when we can have the ACO take these functions on. Next slide. Then there are the operational issues, who's going to handle what, and finally, performance metrics that I want to talk about for a moment. As to performance metrics, of course, we're going to be looking at both quality and efficiency. On the physician quality side, we'll look at such things as screening for breast cancer, colon cancer, chlamydia in women. We'll look at cholesterol management, childhood immunization status, medication monitoring. On the hospital side, the quality metrics uh, we'll look at could include the national hospital quality measures for acute MI, pneumonia, congestive heart failure. We'll look at recognized measures for central line associated bloodstream infection, ventilator associated pneumonia, catheter-associated urinary tract infections, and, and we'll look at patient satisfaction surveys, including the CAPS survey. As to efficiency measures, on the physician side, we'll look at emergency department, possible avoidable visits, we'll look at prescription drug utilization, number of prescriptions written, and generic prescribing rate, and we'll look at imaging, spine MRI, spine CT, abdominal CT rates per thousand, and, spe and specialist costs per episode. Hospital efficiency metrics will look at lengths of stay, admits per thousand, days per thousand, the heat is all cause readmission rate, and per member per month cost. Next slide. Actual performance on each of the metrics will be fed into a scorecard that we'll create for our ACO partners. And this slide is just an, a high-level overview of what a scorecard might look like. Our scoring model will not just reward for a high score, but also for improvement. Next slide. Shared savings quality gate. This slide is important because it shows that the ACO has to reach a quality threshold before becoming eligible for any shared savings payout. So we're establishing what we're calling a quality gate. This is not about rationing care. Instead, it's about delivering just the right amount of care in the most efficient and high-quality manner possible. Next slide. Timetable for WellPoint ACOs. Well, this slide shows that we're planning to be up and running in January of 2011 based on existing benefit plans. 
We're in January. I can tell you we're almost there. By mid-2011, we intend to expand to our self-funded clients. WellPoint does have a large uh, ASO self-insured uh, client base and additional markets uh, as well. By January 2012, we expect to have a new ACO product and benefit design, which we're really excited about. Um, throughout the rest of the year, we'll be working on expanding our market penetration. And I have to tell you, we've developed quite an internal structure for uh, handling the ACO development and implementation work. And those people work hand in hand with our um, external ACO partners. We have an umbrella ACO steering committee and reporting to it, it are separate groups that work on member attribution, performance metrics, operations and data exchange, medical management, provider contracting, product development and benefit design, marketing communications, and cost of care. So exactly what does WellPoint have going on now in the ACO arena? Well, earlier today, Kevin told you about uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. Well, uh, last November, we announced with uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock that we would be doing a, an ACO with them, our uh, plan in New Hampshire. So that's pretty exciting, and that will be servicing, and Kevin will correct me if I'm wrong, approximately 20,000 members. We have also announced our partnerships with two large physician groups in California, both of which were selected to participate in the Dartmouth Brookings ACO pilot. These are two of just five Dartmouth Brookings sites, the others being the Carilion Clinic in Roanoke, Virginia, Norton Healthcare in Louisville, Kentucky, and the Tucson Medical Center, and of course, in Tucson. California is probably an optimal site for the development of a physician group-based ACO because the HMO delivery model is already in place. An existing provider infrastructure makes it much easier to develop related processes that will be necessary for the ACO. So the first of the two that we're partnering with is Monarch Healthcare, which is based in Irvine, California, which is Southern California. Monarch has a, a, a medical group and an ITA. It is a large organization with over 800 primary care physicians and 2,500 specialist physicians affiliated, and it will cover primarily, primarily Orange County. We also have a, um, an ACO in the works with Healthcare Partners, which is also in Southern California, based in Torrance, also a medical group and IPA structure, over 1,200 primary care physicians and 3,000 specialists uh, with that group, and it will cover primarily L.A. County. Well, today there are just a handful of ACOs that have been finalized and that I can talk about. We do have a lot in the pipeline. In fact, if we had more time and res more resources, both IT and manpower, we'd probably be doing a lot more. Um, right now, we're in active negotiations with a large vertically integrated health system in, in Virginia and another one in Indiana, two different systems in Maine, and a group in Ohio that's both a provider group and an employer group client of ours. So we're hoping you'll be hearing more about those um, if they'll come to fruition in, in 2011. Next slide. I'm gonna close my presentation with a slide that I borrowed from our California provider team, which they put together as a result of working on the California uh, project for the last six or eight months. And this will show you some early lessons learned. First, dialogue. Do not underestimate the need for lots and lots of dialogue when entering into this type of relationship. There is more that needs to be worked out than you can ever imagine until you've gone through it. Second, incentives. Quality improvement and cost containment are key, and you need to get down to specific measures, specific targets, and document them thoroughly. You're gonna just do the best you can with actuarial projections about future spending based on historical data and hope you've got it right. Third, resources. You may assume that something can be done easily, that people are standing by ready to take on the work, but that's not always the case, even in a company like WellPoint. Never take your resources for granted. Fourth, transparency. In order to make this work, all parties have to be willing to share information and data to a degree that has not previously been done. Everyone's gonna be nervous about this initially, but it'll ha you'll have to take the leap of faith in order to make this work. As one of our upper management uh, said recently, both sides are just gonna have to open their kimonos and be done with it. 
Fifth, IT development. Early on, you need to line up your IT resources. IT is your new best friend. Six, time. Do not underestimate how much time this is going to take. Make sure you've got enough people on your team or you're going to end up burning everyone out. And seventh, flexibility. The ACO, and especially the early ACO, is a dynamic organization. Participants must be nimble and flexible in order to adapt and execute. And we're, we're really just making this up as we go along. What is an ACO going to look like? It could look like any number of things, and we're out there working with those that are wanting to be ACO partners with us to devise the best system for their market that will work for us and our, and our collective members. In conclusion, one of our goals at WellPoint is to create the best healthcare value for our customers. On the patient side, that means recognizing that members 